Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SETI Colloquium series. Very happy today to have Howard Zepker from Stanford give our colloquium. Uh, Howard was an undergraduate at California Institute of Technology, and he did a stint at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, went back to school, got a master's from UCLA, and um, PhD from Stanford. Then he spent another 10 years at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and now he's professor of both earth sciences and engineering at Stanford. And throughout his career, he specialized on space-borne radar, both looking at Earth and other planets. And today he'll tell us about the results from the space, uh, Cassini spacecraft, the radar experiment, looking at the lakes of Titan. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, so I'd like to spend the next 45 minutes or so telling you a little bit about uh, liquids on Titan. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into this as it goes on, but I'll um, uh, go through a few different uh, topics here and, and uh, see how we can go. I have many, many co-authors. I just put a partial list of these folks up here to begin to give you an idea about how most of this work really is a team effort. But in the planetary game, these missions are huge. They take hundreds, if not thousands, of people to put them together and make them work. And so it's, there's, not, there's just not room for a thousand names on this page. But uh, <coughs> I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, uh, to be acknowledged. So uh, some of the main topics that I hope we get time to cover today are, first I'll give you a little bit of an overview about Titan and the solar system. Uh, talk about some of the early images and speculation about lakes and their distribution on Titan, why it's important. Something about the surface properties and composition, how deep these lakes uh, might be and how they're distributed around the planet. <coughs> so Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. Here's a picture from Cassini, and you can see here Saturn in the background, and in the lower right, there's a little blob, and that is Titan. Uh, we get very much closer to Titan in some cases, and you, there's you know, much more detail in the images. But uh, this is just to give you an idea of uh, Titan orbiting Saturn. So here's a bunch of numbers. You don't need to pay too much attention to most of these. Um, but uh, they're there for reference. Uh, the interesting ones to me actually are the two diameters. There's the diameter at the top of the atmosphere, <laughs> which is what you see with an optical telescope from the ground, and the diameter of the actual surface underneath that, because Titan has a very deep and dense atmosphere. And this is important because it means if you take pictures with optical instrumentation, it's th this uh, atmosphere has got a lot of material in it. It's like a cloudy day outside. You don't see very much. And uh, in order to penetrate that, you have to go to a longer wavelength um, uh, material that where the wavelength is much larger than the particles in the clouds. And so using radar with centimeter kind of wavelengths, we can see all the way down to the surface very easily. So in fact, when I was uh, a kid growing up and learning about the planets, and I can remember my planet book back in the 1960s, there, Titan was the largest moon in the solar system, which is one of the reasons that it's named Titan. And if you look again on an optical telescope, it's quite large and it's got this about 5,500 kilometer uh, diameter. But uh, after Voyager, back in the early 1970s, when the first radio measurements were made, it was found that uh, much of that size was due to uh, the atmosphere. And when you actually looked at the solid body, the diameter of Titan drops from 5,500 kilometers to 5,100 kilometers. And in fact, it's only number two in the solar system because Ganymede in orbit around Jupiter is in between those two numbers. So it used to be number one, and now it is just number two. So here's some pictures of Titan from the Earth. And this is about as good as you can get with an optical instrument from the Earth. Uh, this is from the very large telescope in the, uh, in the Andes Mountains. And the uh, set of wavelengths that are chosen for this particular picture here are meant to highlight the atmosphere. And the atmosphere appears kind of blue in this picture. And so you see a body of Titan with some kind of semi-differentiated stuff in it and then surrounded by this very thick 
atmosphere that we see here. So what we want to do with the radar instrument is to be able to look beneath that atmosphere and see what's going on on the surface. Um, the atmosphere is mostly made out of nitrogen. Uh, for those of you who have looked at atmospheres, here's a plot of uh, altitude and temperature. And this is very much like we have on the Earth. You have a temperature, you, you get a raise in temperature as you're going higher, or actually a drop in, initially it's a drop in temperature, and then you get to a place where it bends around, which is the difference between the troposphere and uh, up to higher layers, these bends around. So it's got the same kind of layering as we have here on the Earth. And uh, there are a lot of clouds, and the fact that we have a lot of clouds has given rise to lots and lots of speculation that if you have clouds, you gotta have rain, and if you have rain, you have liquids. And in fact, many of the early thoughts about Titan was that it was completely covered in liquid. And if you go through a lot of theoretical calculations, you can convince yourself that uh, Titan is completely covered with liquids. Um, that turns out to not be the case. And basically everything we've ever learned about Titan, uh, when we've done more study on it, it's always been wrong. And so what I'm gonna show you is a set of current thinking, but if I were to come back here in 10 or 20 years, <laughs> it'll all be wrong and we'll have something else. That's given that we have somebody uh, taking more data and looking at those. So uh, the, the very first radar observations of Titan were made using the Arecibo telescope down in Puerto Rico. There's a picture of it there at the bottom. If you ever get a chance to go to, go to Puerto Rico, I would definitely recommend uh, taking a side trip and going and looking at this thing. It's very <coughs> impressive. It's this huge, uh, uh, this, uh, this huge dish that goes into a natural uh, little valley in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a kilometer all the way around, and so if you go there and you stay and visit uh, because you're using the facility and you like to go out for a run, you can tell exactly how far you've gone by just how many times you went around <laughs> the telescope. So it's really useful for that. And so on top of that, uh, that dish, and it's fixed in a, the, the dish itself is fixed in position, but the feed for the antenna, which is what you see kind of above that, that little structure that's held up by those three poles, can move around a little bit and it can stir, it, it can steer about plus and minus 20 degrees off of axis. So uh, whenever Titan happens to be, or any object happens to be in the right location in the sky, then you can observe it with Arecibo. And there were a number of different observations that were made of, uh, of Titan back uh, in the pre-Cassini days. And essentially what we do is something called Doppler mapping, where we look not only at the time of flight that it takes for a pulse to get from the Earth to Titan and come back, because Titan is rotating with respect to the Earth, then there are Doppler shifts associated with it. And uh, the limbs of the planet are rotating apparently faster, and so they have high Doppler shifts, and you get to the center where all the motion is transverse, the Doppler goes to zero, so you can do some kind of crude mapping. And you get spectra that look something like this. So if you look at this spectrum, which is a sample one from uh, Arecibo, uh, it's got kind of a, it's got something where, where the Doppler frequencies are spread out over oh, 100 hertz or so centered around zero, but then there's a spike right in the center. And that spike right in the center is something that you get if you have a relatively smooth surface. And we'll talk a little bit about why that gives you a spike in a minute, but we call this the specular term. And this tells you about the area exactly beneath the, uh, uh, beneath the antenna. And so we can use this same kind of a technique, in fact, from the spaceborne radars, and we will, to study the surfaces of the lakes the same range Doppler mapping. And so here's a set of observations from the mid-1990s. And if you look at these, you can see you get different spectra. Some of them have spikes and some of them don't. And the early interpretation of this is that the spikes are where you happen to have very, very smooth surfaces. And the places where you don't have the spikes are places where the surface is somewhat rougher. And the initial interpretation of that was that <clears throat> that must be where the liquids are. So if you had ponds or lakes and you had something that if you look at, you know, a lake is relatively smooth compared to the land around it, that's giving you the specular return and uh, the rough part around the outside is giving you this more what we call the diffuse return. 
So that was a really nice tidy thing. It told you something about how, what the fraction of, the, of Titan that was covered by liquid uh, in the equatorial region, because this only actually sees the equatorial parts of Titan, because that's the only place where you can be exactly normal incident onto, uh, onto the surface. Um, you would say that, well, maybe half the time you've got water and half the time, or it's liquid hydrocarbons and not water, but uh, you have time, that time liquids and, and half time not. And uh, that seemed reasonable. It agreed with some of the theoretical stuff. And it was very tantalizing because it told you that, well, some of the images are going to show surfaces like land. And some of them are going to show surfaces like liquid. And that's much more interesting than any other planetary you know, body that we look at because the rest of them all kind of look the same. If you look at Mars, you look at uh, Venus, you look at uh, Mercury, they're this, you know, basically the same everywhere. Well, this turns out to be wrong. And in fact, there's no liquids in the equatorial part of Titan at all that we can see. We don't know why we get these specular returns here, but there must be something that makes it act as if the surface is very, very flat. But we have no idea what the answer to that is. But it's not, it's not the liquids that people originally thought. So if we want to see something in more detail than these gross spectra, we have to get up closer. And so NASA built uh, the Cassini mission. Uh, there were partners with the Italian Space Agency in doing this. Uh, this was launched in the late 1990s. It took seven years to get to Saturn and began sending data back in the early 2000s. And this uh, spacecraft is in orbit around both Saturn, uh, well, it's in, in orbit around Saturn, and on some of these orbits, when it's swinging its way around and around, it passes close enough to Titan that we get close up observations of Titan. So there have been, up till date, till now, something like uh, 120 of these orbits around Titan, uh, pro around Saturn, and probably 40 or 50 of those have been close enough to get uh, pretty good uh, images and uh, radar observations of Titan. The spacecraft has a great many instruments on it. Uh, don't worry about the details here. Uh, the, but the major instruments are uh, optical and infrared imaging systems and also the microwave systems. Uh, primarily a radar, but the radar is used also for something called radio occultation. Some of you are uh, working on, on that uh, uh, as well, and that's where you just send a signal, basically a continuous wave signal through the atmosphere or perhaps bounce it off the surface. You analyze the echoes and we can learn something about what's going on on the surface. We're not going to talk about those today. We'll be talking entirely about radar observations today. So here's a close-up picture of Titan from the imaging system. And uh, unfortunately, if you look at this, this, it looks still pretty bland. You don't see very much because you're mostly looking at this atmosphere. Um, there are some little dark areas up near the poles, which now we know from the radar uh, observations actually are uh, these lake features. This is the North Pole view, uh, visible in this particular picture here. Some of them are named here. But you do see these sort of dark things that uh, uh, show that something is different at the pole than elsewhere on the surface. Um, it's a little bit, you, you don't, if you didn't know that these were lakes, you'd just see these splotches here and you'd be all kinds of good speculations and you could prove all kinds of stuff with all kinds of theories, but you know, if you have little enough data, you can prove almost anything. <laughs> oh, uh, um, let's see, the wavelength, the, the question was about what the wavelength is, it's two centimeters wavelength. And um, I've been instructed that uh, questions should really wait until we get to the question period at the end because the people out in video land cannot uh, hear them. So please remember them and ask them at that point. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to answer at that time. So here's an image of the North Polar region from the radar system. Uh, and uh, basically, this is the, the disk of Titan north of about uh, 30 degrees or so. Uh, with the uh, lake areas, and you can see the distribution of the uh, liquids here. They're all up in the polar uh, region um, in great, great more detail than what we saw before. And this picture doesn't do it justice because I had to cram a lot of space into this, but you can see that there's a distribution of these lakes which are colored down in the black and the blue colors, and then the land which is shown here in the yellow colors around that. But basically, um, you know, we can see much more detail by being able to penetrate the atmosphere. So the radar system itself 
uh, for those of you who like the technical things, so here we go, 2.2 centimeters um, listed here as the wavelength. It's a system that's got five different antenna beams. Um, here they're denoted, denoted beams one through five. Uh, one, two, four, and five are all the same. Number three is a little bit narrower. That means the antenna has a little bit higher gain. And so we use that one when we need to have very, very precise measurements. Of, uh, of the surface. But basically this thing sweeps along with the five beams so you can measure a fairly wide swath and uh, we get uh, images that then have five separate strips that we have to put together in order to make the surface, to make the pictures of the surfaces. And essentially what happens, every time we fly by Titan on one of these orbits around Saturn, you sweep out an area with those antennas and you get a bunch of strips that look something like the one that's shown on the bottom here. And we'll zoom in on this a little bit more. But the uh, resolution of these things is on the order of a few hundred to maybe 500 or 1,000 meters, depending on the uh, imaging geometry. But uh, it's pretty fine resolution. So you can think of the resolution of this as it's probably a little bit larger than the building that we're in right now. Um, but uh, it's not a whole lot larger than that. And when you think about mapping the surface of a planet you know, at that kind of resolution, it's a lot of points and you can see an awful lot of details. The resolution from the optical system is uh, tens if not hundreds of kilometers. So this is uh, a thousand times better. And here's a couple of pictures um, of different kinds of features that we see. On the left is half of an impact crater. And it's only half because that's where the swath happened to go. It didn't get the other part of it. But there's a dark area in the center with this really rough thing on the outside um, that's caused by material that was uh, thrown out of that central caldera, that central crater uh, from an impact. On the right, you see something that has a bunch of little stripes in it. If you look carefully, let going left and right, you see this thing that looks a little bit like Venetian blinds there. These are sand dunes that are found largely in the equatorial um, uh, regions of Titan. And it probably is from the solid material, which is bits of solid hydrocarbons that uh, get piled up. And we don't really know the mechanism. Um, Theoretically, you want to believe that these things got piled up by winds, and in fact, it takes winds to build up dunes, as far as we know. However, all the measurements we've tried to make of winds show that there is no wind <laughs> operating on Titan either. There's lots of theories that show you that it has to be there. <laughs> And I'll show you a plot that can prove that the winds are there. <laughs> but when we make the observations, at least in the polar regions over the lakes, we see that there actually are no winds um, that have been verified. That doesn't mean they're not there. We could just be unlucky, or so there's something else going on that we don't understand. Uh, but there are still many, many pi uh, puzzles about, uh, about this body. In the polar area, though, you see this huge number of lakes of all different uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, there's no difference between these two pictures here other than one of them is the radar intensity coded in black and white and the other one it's coded in color because that was going into a magazine and we needed something that made it look a little bit more like land and water. So those colors don't mean anything at all. It's a single wavelength uh, radar observation. Um, but you can see that there's all kinds of different things of different, uh, of different sizes, and they're, they're everywhere. These two strips themselves are about uh, 50 each about 50 kilometers wide, so the size of those lakes gets down to the kilo few kilometer uh, size. So once we can actually make these different kinds of measurements, especially of the, of the lake areas, uh, we want to ask ourselves about what the composition and structure might be of the material that's in these lakes. So the really common stuff on the surface of Titan is various different kinds of hydrocarbons. Um, there, in terms of gases, there's methane and ethane. Uh, then there's all kinds of solid materials when these things start to freeze out. And uh, some of these materials, like methane um, and ethane, both, again, if they're cooled below about 90, 91, 92 Kelvin, then they um, become liquid. And so they can, in fact, accumulate as liquids. And so it's very analogous to the Earth. In the Earth, we have water, which can be either solid, liquid, or gas, depending on the temperature. Well, hydrocarbons play that role on Titan. 
And we can distinguish them from each other because the difference between what we call the dielectric constant of uh, hydrocarbons when it's frozen versus uh, liquid uh, is pretty uh, high. And so we get a different kind of a character to the return signal uh, in the radar images. And so um, we can use that then to also identify a little bit more about the composition. So we can start, uh, in fact, uh, throwing out some kinds of hydrocarbons and leaving other ones still uh, as potentially in the mix. And we actually use two different kinds of measurements. One is the radar backscatter measurements that you've been seeing here, which is the reflectivity. But we also look at something that we, uh, called the radiometric signature, which is essentially um, uh, how much uh, radiation is being emitted by these different, ob these different materials on the surface. And they emit radiation because they're above absolute zero, and everything above absolute zero radiates a little bit. And the warmer it is, and uh, depending on what we call, again, this dielectric constant, uh, we get different amounts of radiation. So that's another way to distinguish these, and we'll talk about how we can, uh, can use those in detail in a moment. So the important thing to remember, though, is what the radar measures is only the electrical properties of the surface. Um, we, you know, it's not a, it's, it, 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 we, even though we display it as pictures, they're not, the, they're not pictures like you're used to thinking about taking with your camera or your phone. If you were on the surface of Titan and you snapped a picture on your phone, it would probably not look anything like what we're seeing here because we look at things in the optical region with our eyes, and that doesn't mean that the microwave region would look anything like what we have here. So um, the, we, we, we get the surface roughness and the slopes in terms of uh, uh, making measurements as a function of pointing angle, and that's really what those Doppler spectra that I showed you before were. And um, we also get estimates of this dielectric constant, which tells us something about what the composition of the surface is. And if you look at a bunch of, this is just a table to give you a few different things to give you uh, an idea of how well we can distinguish these. Um, the first two entries, which are the important ones for Titan, are the liquid and solid hydrocarbons. Liquid hydrocarbons have dielectric constants on the order of 1.6 to 1.9. Uh, if it is frozen, it's higher on the order of 2 to 2.4. So all we have to do is tell whether it's bigger than 2 or less than 2. That tells if it's, uh, us if it's frozen or solid. And we also get an idea of something that we call the loss tangent. And essentially, that's related to, this, uh, to uh, the amount of energy that is emitted uh, as a function of temperature. So if we know the temperature, we know how much, uh, mater how much energy is emitted, we can look at this, uh, this loss tangent. And it's typically a pretty small number, um, at least for these materials. Uh, water ice, which is also common in the outer solar system, has a dielectric constant somewhat higher. It's 3.2 and has a very, very low loss tangent. It turns out there's not much water ice on the surface, except for perhaps a few mountainous uh, uh, regions. But uh, most of the surface looks to be solid uh, and liquid hydrocarbons. Earth soils, if you did the same experiment with a satellite in orbit around the Earth, the dielectric constants are higher yet. Soils tend to be between about 3 and 9 for the dielectric constant and a much higher loss tangent. Seawater has a dielectric constant of about 100, and the loss tangent is huge. It's about uh, 1. So the interesting thing about the loss tangent and why we use that kind of a term is that the bigger that value is, the, more, uh, the harder it is for a wave to penetrate the material. So if seawater has, has this loss tangent of unity, which means that the waves can basically go about one wavelength into the surface before they're, they go away, which means if you want to hide something, stick it in seawater. So um, that may sound kind of silly, but this is why we have submarines and why they don't tell people where they are, because once they're under the water, you have no idea where they are, and there's almost, you, know, you have to do something uh, acoustically with sonar in order to be able to find them. So there have been a number of measurements made of, uh, of the different bodies in the solar system to give you an idea for some of the magnitudes of some of these kinds of um, uh, measurements from uh, both Cassini measurements of Titan and by comparison measurements of the moon made with some of the early uh, instruments back even as early as the 1960s. Um, the dielectric constants that are measured on Titan uh, 
tend to be in this range of, say, 1.9 to a maximum of maybe 3.6, uh, with the, with uh, the, what we which I've labeled the scatterometer, but that means radar. It's a particular configuration of a radar system. The radiometers, which make measurements of the emitted radiation, get slightly lower values for the dielectric constants, but uh, the radiometric measurements are always biased a little bit uh, low. For air, the reason has to do with details of the radar scattering process that we probably don't need to get into here. And the RMS slope, the roughness of the surface, is on the order of 5 to 13 uh, degrees. So if you took a little facet of ground on the order of a few wavelengths in size, the, most of them are within about uh, 5, 10 degrees of, of normal. That's how rough that surface actually gets. Uh, if you look at the lunar observations, the dielectric constants are somewhat higher uh, because it's rocky materials rather than being uh, the hydrocarbons which is consistent, and again, the radiometer gets lower values than the radar does. And the radiometer ones, again, are, are, are low estimates. But the roughnesses are actually pretty comparable on the surface of the moon and on Titan. It's still on the order of this 10 degrees or so. So the interesting thing about these lakes is that if they are liquid, Liquids tend to have a pretty flat surface on the top because gravity you know, causes them all to just um, you know, basically even themselves out. You know, gravity on a rough surface, uh, if you wait long enough, the Earth will, would eventually uh, get completely flat. So if you did nothing to the Earth and you waited billions of years, eventually all of the mountains would sink down, all the, the canyons would get filled in and come up. And this is not from erosion, but just as the materials flow over time. Now, the viscosity of rock is really high, and so it doesn't flow very quickly, which is why you have to wait billions of years for it to happen. But in liquid, it will absorb, you know, it'll adjust itself very, very quickly. And so what we can do uh, in order to look at the surface and see if, uh, if we have a liquid surface or a solid surface is to see how smooth the surfaces of those lakes are. And we do that with the radar signal by basically illuminating a small patch of the ground directly below us. And if the surface is very, very flat, and uh, that means that the radar echoes from all the areas that are being illuminated will, uh, will, be, will, will take almost the exact same path length going from the radar to the surface and come back up. And so all those little waves add up in phase. Um, what that means is that there's constructive interference of all those little radar signals. They all add up together, and so you get a very, very big uh, return. And that's why we get that really big spike in the specular area if there is liquid below it. If the surface is much rougher, such that the roughness of the surface is more than a fraction of the wavelength of the radiation, then the waves tend to cancel each other out a little bit, and you end up with... Um, uh, with a signal that's much, much lower. So we can look at the amplitude uh, of, these, of these reflections, decide if the waves are adding up in phase or out of phase, and very quickly see if the lakes are not just dark areas that are dark for some you know, other reason or if they're actually very, very smooth. And so we do that uh, by sending a bunch of pulses down to the surface, and we look and see how the waves add up over time. I'm going to go through this part really quickly. Don't feel like you have to pay too much attention here, but I want to give you a little bit of flavor of what we go through. This is what, the tra this is what we get if we get a uh, bunch of echoes coming back from a series of pulses aimed straight down on the surface. This happens to come from an area where the surface is quite uh, smooth, and so in fact we get a high amplitude. And so there's in fact 14 or 15 pulses shown here with a little bit of time in between each one. So in between gives us an idea of what the noise level is in our system, and the peak of this signal uh, then allow, we can use that, the ra the, that peak signal compared to the noise level to be able to measure the amplitude of that re re received signal. And again, if that's a really big number, it tells us that we're looking at a very, very smooth surface. So um, here is just blow-ups of the noise level with its amplitude and one of the echo uh, pulses with its amplitude. And again, by comparing the power from where the noise is to where the signal is, that ratio 
allows us then, because we know what the noise characteristics of the receiver are, we can compute how large that particular signal happens to be. And we go through something called the radar equation, which is basically just balancing energy, it's conservation of energy in different places. And it allows us to relate the signal that we receive, which is what I called P signal on the left, to something that we call the radar cross section, which is essentially the inherent radar reflectivity of the surface. And all the rest of those parameters have to do with the geometry and the characteristics of the, of the, um, of the receiver. So if you want to look at uh, how these echoes would differ, whether or not you're looking at land or lake, on the top is, is uh, two simulated signals, and on the bottom is four actually measured signals. Um, the very, very top layer is one of, as an, an echo from one of these very specular ones, where we're getting uh, all these signals adding up in phase. The amplitude is pretty high. And on the right is the spectrum, basically the Fourier transform of those data. And the spectrum uh, is essentially, it looks like a, uh, uh, like a little boxcar function. And so it's pretty flat across the top, uh, and this is theoretical. In contrast to the non-specular echo, which is down below, you can see that the amplitude is much, much less, and the, and the spectrum has got a bunch of wiggles in it due to all this destructive interference that you get from the waves coming back. So that's what we get from trying to simulate these signals to understand them theoretically. Observations of four different points on the surface are shown, shown below. The top one and the bottom one are coming from land areas. The amplitude is somewhat left and the spectra are all scrambled. But the two in the middle come from one of the lakes and you can see this nice spectrum on the right and a good uh, size signal there on the left. And so we can make that map as we fly by and we get a whole bunch of different spectra that look like this. I know this is much too small to see, but essentially we make all these measurements and then one by one we look at them and we try to see whether or not the, uh, the, it's coming from liquid or from, uh, or from solid. So here's some data from one part near the North Pole of Titan. Uh, there's the bursts is just a way of keeping track of which pulse we're on. We can relate that to the position of the spacecraft, which tells us what we're looking at. And so what this does is it starts actually in the north. So the one that says burst 36849 goes across one of the lakes and it comes out again on the land down where it says burst 37039. In fact, those were all the spectra that we saw in the previous plot. In more detail, these are where the individual bursts are located. Uh, these, ha these are the ones that are just over the liquid itself, and so the ones over uh, these uh, that are shown here in green, we would expect, if that was a liquid, to give us that nice uh, specular return that's a very, very bright signal. So let's just plot here the magnitude of those signals as a function of latitude. And so the scale on the left is in decibels, so it's a log scale. So you start out something around uh, about 83, 84 dB or so coming from the land. And this is just an arbitrary number at this point. We haven't gone through that calibration yet. And then all of a sudden it jumps way up to 115 dB or so, wiggles around a little bit until you get to the end of the lake, and then it drops back down to something in the 80s. So the signal increased by 20 decibels, which is a factor of 100 in, uh, uh, in, uh, in size. So we get 100 times the echo when we're going over the lakes as to when we're going over the lands. And that's very, very consistent with this idea of this surface being really, really smooth. Now, it could, in fact, be solid. But it would have to be solid um, you know, and very, very smooth. And we'll talk about those numbers in, in just a moment. It turns out that it's just too smooth to be any kind of a natural surface. If you built a mirror, yes, you could do it. But as far as we know, there was nobody building large mirrors and covering the lakes on Titan. So going through a little bit more math that we don't need to go through here, uh, we can come up with an expression that relates that radar cross-section, the sigma that we have on the left of this equation here, through a bunch of parameters that have to do with the, um, uh, with the radar observation geometry and something inside that exponential on the right called sigma h, which is essentially the RMS or the roughness scale of the surface. <coughs> 
Okay? So for different values of roughness, you'd get different values here of that radar cross-section sigma. So if we go through what I was saying before, we can we compare the amplitude in the noisy area to the amplitude uh, where the signal was. We can measure that value of sigma, and then knowing the geometry, we can compute how rough that surface happens to be. I get something that looks like this. One of the parameters in that previous equation uh, had um, uh, dependence on it. And so we, in fact, get a family of curves. And I've just plotted here, uh, essentially, uh, the red is for a dielectric constant of 1.7, kind of at the bottom of the liquid scale, up to about 2.5, which is beyond the top of the solid scale. But if you look at the roughness on the left, the range of roughnesses is either from about from one millimeter up to two millimeters. Okay? A millimeter is that big. So the surface of those lakes is flat down to this much. There is nowhere on the Earth of any kind of a naturally occurring surface that has that um, uh, roughness on any kind of a size scale greater than you know a few inches or so. If you were to go out and if you took uh, if you made a mud slurry and you poured it out on the ground uh, in a, and, and carefully let that dry. Uh, that little small bit would, in fact, get down to millimeter size roughness. A parking lot, like what you have out here, I actually didn't look at your parking lot too much, but a reasonably maintained parking lot has RMS roughnesses of five-ish five -ish millimeters or more. So the surface of, that, of those lakes is really smooth. Now on, on Earth, Lakes, especially at the scales of tens to hundreds to thousands of meters like we're talking about here, you almost never see a lake that's that flat, and that's because we have a lot of wind. It doesn't take much wind to make small ripples on a lake. So if you've ever water skied, you know that if you're not the very first boat out in the morning, you're going to have waves the entire day uh, because even a very small disturbance will give you pretty good sized uh, waves. So the, these, uh, these lakes are incredibly flat and unfortunately that means that the only explanation is there isn't any way, any wind that's roughening up these waves. And we've made this measurement over a number of the different lakes and every time we make it we get values that look like this. Now, the theory could be wrong, we may have forgotten about something, maybe there are waves and we don't know it, but uh, near as we can tell there aren't any. So there were a, a number of those curves that you saw before were from different, for different values of that dielectric constant. Um, how can we get a better handle on the dielectric constant? Well, the way, the way we do that is we look at the radiometer data, essentially this emission temperature of those surfaces. So we have a few more equations that take dielectric constant and temperature into account. Um, if something is in what we call thermal equilibrium, the emissivity, which is how much is emitted from the surface, is, is uh, essentially the inverse of the radar rec reflectivity, which is rho in that top equation. Basically, uh, the amount of reflected energy has to be the same. Uh, if, you, if you take the reflected energy and you add it to the amount that's absorbed, you have to get one back because there's conservation of energy. And if you're in thermal equilibrium, that means that it's not getting hotter or cooler. So therefore, the amount of absorption is the same as the amount of emission. And if you go through all of this, then you can get this relatively simple equation on the bottom that relates the physical temperature of the surface to the radio temperature of the surface, which differ depending on what that dielectric constant is. So um, if we know, uh, we, we have uh, uh, estimates of the physical temperature of the surface. It's on the or in, in the lake region, it's probably between 90 and, well, probably between 91 and 93 uh, Kelvin or so. And the uh, brightness temperatures are what we measure with the radiometer. So we can use that then to infer how the, um, uh, how the uh, dielectric constant changes as a function of time. And you get curves, again, that look something like this. You can see that as the dielectric constant changes, the brightness temperature changes, and there are different curves for different values or assumed values of the physical temperature. So here are the dielectric, uh, or here's the observed di brightness temperature 
that we get over um, the, that same region of bursts that we saw before. It starts out when you're over the land about 88 Kelvin or so. When you get over the liquid, it jumps up to about 90 and a half or so. And then when you get past the liquid, it drops back down to 88. So something is different between those two. And what's different, of course, is the dielectric constant because there's no particular reason to think that the waves or that the lakes would have a different temperature than the shoreline right next to them, although that's certainly uh, a possibility. And if you go through then and convert those brightness temperatures into dielectric constants, you get something that looks like this. So these are the, you know, varying the physical temperature from 91 and a half up to 92 and a half for the blue, green, and red, uh, where you're looking at the solid surfaces, the dielectric constants that we see are on the order of a maybe 2 to 2.4, which is exactly what I showed in that table uh, before. And when you're over the liquid area, you're down in this 1.6 to 1.9 region. And that sure seems to be what's going on in here. So it's giving us a very consistent picture. Uh, it's probably a liquid because the dielectric constant is right. It's probably a liquid because the specular radar reflection is right. And so that's almost for sure what, in fact, we're, uh, we're looking at. And you can, you know, this is, this is a, a summary of a lot of that stuff in, in one too busy chart, but basically uh, it's telling us the same thing as what that previous uh, uh, graph did in graphical uh, format. But we get a relatively um, small range of, um, uh, of dielectric constant uh, uncertainty based on what we think the plausible values of the physical temperature uh, might be. The average, uh, uh, the equatorial temperature of Titan physically is around 94 Kelvin or so. The poles are a couple of degrees cooler, so in fact there is circulation in the atmosphere. And it's one of the mechanisms perhaps for getting uh, liquids only up at the, up at the poles. So um, here's one of the complicated models of winds. And so what we're looking at here are a couple of uh, predictions about what the wind uh, speeds ought to be on Titan. And uh, the black curve is for the um, northern latitudes. The gray one is for the southern ones. When, uh, when the winds are high in the north, they're not in the south, and, and vice versa, depending on whether it's winter or summer, and you know, how you define which one is which. But northern atmosphere, summer, you expect uh, winds in the north, northern atmosphere, winter, you'd expect winds in the south. And what this says is that um, uh, theoretically the models of the surface are such that the wind speeds have to be on the order of 0.2 to 0.4 um, uh, meters per second or so, which is plenty of wind speed to kick up waves. And so if you believe these models, there has to be waves going on in those, uh, in those lakes. However, when we make the observations and try to look for them, we just plain don't see them. And so you got to decide what you're going to do. Do you believe your data or do you believe your models? And you know, that's a debate that uh, I'm sure many of you in this room <laughs> have had many, many times. And <laughs> I'm not going to try to call that one because I don't know who. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way to, it, it, uh, you know, it's a matter of belief. <laughs> anyway. The point is, the models say that the wind ought to be there, the measurements say that it's not there, and so it remains a really tantalizing puzzle of something that we need to think about and try to understand what's going on here. So like I say, everything we have decided that we know, and I can say that we either know that the waves are there, or I can say that we know that the waves aren't there, <laughs> somebody is wrong and we're probably both wrong. So it'll be interesting to see what happens as we get into the future. So uh, in conclusion about the surface of the, of the ocean, um, the, in, these, uh, in these major lakes that we've made measurements on, um, we get these specular scatters from the liquid area and we get the diffuse scattering from the land. Uh, the roughness seems to be on the order of a millimeter or possibly less, and that's more consistent with uh, liquid methane than it is of liquid ethane. Um, there is no evidence of waves at, um, you know, from uh, any of these measurements that we've never done. And uh, the physical temperatures that we get are actually quite similar to what uh, has been inferred from a number of the other uh, measurements, some of the radiometric um, uh, infrared measurements that were made on uh, Cassini as well. So it's all really telling a pretty uh, tidy story there. <laughs>
So we're kind of getting uh, close to the end. Let me just go really, really fast through one last thing because one of the questions that we might still have about the lakes uh, has to do with uh, how deep they are. And let me just show you a little bit about how we make that kind of measurement as well. So because the loss tangent of these materials is very, very low, we can get the waves to penetrate really quite well through many, many meters, perhaps hundreds of meters of material. And so looking at the uh, echoes, you get, an, you get a reflection off of the top of the lake, but some of that energy goes down into the liquid, hits the bottom, and then comes back up. And so you see a secondary echo a little bit later, and the difference between the times of those echoes gives you an estimate of what the depth of the lake is. And so here's a set of data. Um, this is a little bit larger area than, uh, than I've been showing previously. Um, but essentially to the left is where you're looking at just the land area, and that's all at an altitude of zero. The left-hand axis, axis um, is uh, it's proportional to the, to the time delay. And then when you get to the liquid area, which is from about 40 to 80 on this plot here, the amplitude goes way up. Remember, it jumps up by about a factor of 100. And then when you get past it, it drops back down again when you get to the land. So all of that is what we've already seen before. But if you look very, very carefully beneath this thing that is labeled subsurface, you see a little bit of yellowish green below that, which is that secondary echo. Now it's much, much dimmer because it had to you know, penetrate through the liquid and get reflected off the bottom and come back up. But when we analyze this in detail, then we can make an estimate here of what the depth of the lakes are and in fact how what the size of that secondary echo is with respect to the top and the size of those tells us how much of the signal was absorbed in the liquid and so we can get another estimate of that lost tangent so you can see that in this pass across this lake um, the depth of the lake varies between the very deepest from maybe 150 meters or so and in the more shallow areas maybe in the 70 uh, 60 meter region or so. So these lakes are pretty large. They're not particularly deep. Um, you know, they're, the oceans on the earth, of course, are much, much deeper than this. Um, these are, it's deeper than the bay. The average depth in the bay, uh, actually if you, do, if you do it everywhere, <laughs> the average depth of the bay is about two meters. So it's not really very deep, but that's being weighted a lot by very, very shallow stuff around the outside. Uh, the deepest naturally occurring parts of the bay are on the order of 10 meters or so. Uh, the channels that the ships go through are dredged down to 15 or 20 meters. It's really not all that deep. It looks much more impressive from above than when you actually go through uh, and measure it. And we get about 35 dB of signal loss when we make the uh, attenuation measurements through the, through the system. And so that gives us an estimate of that loss tangent. Um, that lot, we were talking before about uh, numbers 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. Um, that varies heavily on what we assume about how efficient the bottom of the lake is at reflecting that, in, that energy. Because if the lake bottom itself is absorbed and scattering, then that's going to look the same as attenuation through the material is. So there's something to be uh, unraveled there. It turns out that uh, looking at um, what I called scattering efficiency, which was Whereas one is it returns 100% of the information of the, of the energy straight back up versus a scattering efficiency of 0.1 where only 10% of it gets back up. You get the same 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4 uh, kind of range in, in loss tangent. So that's all, uh, all similar. And um, without going through uh, some of the other details there in, in order of time, um, what this tells us about the, the depth is that the maximum depth is on the order of about 160 meters or so. Given that, we get this loss tangent on the 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, which is really very, very pure ethane or methane. Uh, virtually anything else that you add to ethane or methane will tend to make it much more absorptive, and you simply cannot get that uh, degree of penetration of a wave into the signal if it's got propylene or acetylene or some of these other hydrocarbon materials in it. The seafloor itself is consistent with uh, being made up of solid hydrocarbons. Um, the, there are many, many models that can give you that 0.1 to 1 scattering efficiency that we were talking about before. 
And so that all uh, really, um, uh, again, tells us something pretty consistent. So given our time, I think I'd just like to pause there and thank all of you for inviting me here. And now we can have the questions. use my position to ask the first question. Um, so you said that waves have not been seen on Titan. So last year at the conference, I've heard from people saying that there are waves, and they were uh, of impressive height of a centimeter or so. Uh, and uh, so it, has this been uh, retracted, or is it a different difference in opinion about this? It's a difference of opinion. Um, you know, it basically has to do with the uh, idea of whether or not you believe the the models or you believe the data. Um, I personally, my bias, you probably guessed by the way I've been saying, is that I tend to go by the data. But you know, there is many, many people who really like the theoretical stuff and think that it gives them additional insight. Um, th there are many reasons that this could be different. They could say that, well, theoretically, there are all these waves here, but you know, it's 100 kilometers away from where you made your measurements. So I don't know what happened where you were, but the, but the waves are all just outside of where you're, where you're seeing. There is this story. You have a Sagan Institute here, right? If I get that right? Or, so there was a story that Carl Sagan used to tell. It was basically about Venus rather than Titan, but that's OK. It's applicable anywhere. He had this story about how um, in the popular um, uh, thoughts about Venus back before the space age, you had this picture of Venus with, uh, with dinosaurs in it, you know, in the, in the lush uh, um, you know, forests and that kind of stuff, which was all generated because if you look at Venus in a telescope, it's covered around with clouds. The clouds are there all the time. Venus is closer to the Earth than the sun, so it's got to be warmer. So clearly, if you have really warm temperatures and lots of clouds, it must be raining a lot. You have tropical rainforests. And you know what lives in a warmer climate with tropical rainforests? It's dinosaurs, so you have to have dinosaurs on Venus. <laughs> and he used to point this out as an example where you have the only observation you have is, I can't see the surface, so I don't know anything. <laughs> and the conclusion, inescapably, is dinosaurs. <laughs> So we're trying to avoid these dinosaurs here. <laughs> well, I, I can't fault that logic. Um, <laughs> let's assume for the moment that all of your observations are correct, uh, as opposed to the theory. And I'm, from my point of view, this is all very exotic, right? Because of the temperature and the materials involved. So I was wondering if you could help me visualize if I were an astronaut standing on the surface of Titan by a lake. What would it look like? What color would it look like? How opaque would the ethane, methane be? And if I like picked up a rock and threw it in, what would the ripples look like compared to water at those temperatures and materials? OK, so um, I mean, you asked a lot of different things. Uh, the viscosity of the liquids is not that different from the Earth, uh, or Earth-born water. So if you were standing there and you threw a rock in it, um, to the best of our understanding, it would have ripples that were not too different than what we have here. The restoring force on the ripples is a little bit less than the, I mean, the, the, the gravity part of it is less than what we have on the Earth. There is surface tension, you know, for waves that are somewhat smaller and they would damp at some other uh, rate. And we don't really know those values very well. Those are poorly determined. And in fact, all of these parameters that we've been quoting about the hydrocarbon uh, materials, they're very, very hard measurements to make on the Earth because it's hard to duplicate exactly what the, what the um, conditions are at 90 Kelvin. But people have made measurements. There are laboratories that people have set up to do these kinds of things, and they get these different kinds of, of numbers. In terms of what it would look like, just as an observational geologist, um, I'm, you know, my experience is walking on the Earth and coming across a lake you know, and seeing what it looks like. And I don't see any reason that it wouldn't look a whole lot different than that. I mean, you've seen pictures of Mars, lots of them. Um, you could convince yourself you're somewhere on the Earth if you come across that terrain. So my guess is that it would look something like this, but it would just be ice and snow uh, with a liquid lake in between it. So if you go up to Lake Tahoe in the middle of the winter and there's lots of snow on the ground that you, tromp, that you, you know, tromp through and you see the lake and it's out there, 
Um, it would be flatter than Lake Tahoe, but other than that, I think it would look probably something much like that. Thanks for the talk. Uh, could you comment a bit on what sort of weather phenomena these, this data might imply? So, um, the, first of all, the radio doesn't, uh, we, we, we specifically use the radio uh, wavelength to not be very sensitive to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is where the weather happens. Okay. Now, there are many other instruments on Cassini that do look at variations in the cloud patterns and things like that. And in fact, people have interpreted some of the uh, observations of brightening and darkening and temporal change of the cloud patterns with uh, rain events. So um, if you look at the, um, at the amount of material that uh, would precipitate out of the atmosphere over time, very, very slow, <coughs> excuse me, over the, the lifetime of Titan, it's a few hundred meters worth of material. It's pretty, it'd be like very, very light snow happening all the time. It's not clear if that happens over time at that same rate all the time or it happens sporadically with bigger storms. Some of the variations that people see in the atmospheres have been speculated to be almost like thunderstorms where you have large storms and a lot of stuff coming out of the atmosphere at once. So there are reasonable reasons to think that you could have all those extremes and of course anything in between. Um, what these data show is that at the time of these measurements, at the location of these measurements, the wind level is zero. Now the wind can't be zero everywhere because there is a difference in temperature between the pole and the equator. So there has to be some kind of, uh, of flow in the atmosphere. Um, it must be very slow and, uh, perhaps, the, uh, and it, perhaps it just doesn't ever quite get to the polar area exactly where these hydrocarbons are located. Because one of the ideas is that the liquids are at the poles because the, the, the atmosphere moves up there and that's where it rains and then it circulates down and picks up more stuff out of the atmosphere and goes back again. So that's one pretty common thing that the people who do the global circulation models believe. I actually think it's a little bit different. I think the liquid comes from, in, I think it's always in the, surf, in the ground, the same as water is here on the Earth. And we see it on the poles because Titan is flatter than it ought to be. And so if you have a, you know, the equivalent of a hydrocarbon water table, you would expect to see more of it near the, near the poles than in the equator. But this is just, you know, it's a, it's a discussion that we have and uh, we don't really have data that can really distinguish amongst those kinds of models yet. I understand that there are a couple of uh, pictures, um, infrared and or visible, that show speculative reflections off of the uh, lakes at the polar regions. So that would indicate Again, um, that it has to be really flat. Yeah, and, and even flatter than the, than the radar measurements. Uh, well, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the problem with those measurements is that it's really hard to make the amplitude measurements with that kind of, of, of an instrument. And so if it were perfectly flat the way, you know, if it was, you know, one millimeter is really flat for us. One millimeter is not flat for a one micron uh, optical observation. So it's probably not the same kind of coherent addition that we're seeing. However, in forward scatter, it turns out that uh, you actually can have a much rougher surface and still see that same kind of, of specularity. So in fact, a millimeter's worth of roughness in an optical area viewed at a grazing angle would give you those bright flashes that they see. So I think that that is pretty, um, it's pretty consistent. Uh, the, the problem is they don't always see the specular areas and that gives fuel to the people who say, well, that's because there was wind that day and so, you know, you didn't get any kind of a specular return. Um, but there's a lot of reasons that, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can, um, there's a lot of reasons for not seeing something. <laughs> and so you don't, it, it's, it's a lot, uh, it's a tantalizing idea, but it's, I think, a lot less definitive than this kind of a controlled experiment. I seem to recall that water is one of the few things that actually gets less dense as it freezes out and comes up. 
which makes me think, what's at the bottom of these lakes? Is it the material freezing from the bottom up? Um, the <clears throat> solid methane does not float in methane. Solid ethane does not float in ethane. I don't remember if solid methane will float in ethane or vice versa or not. Um, but the, it's, it's a slightly different thing that happens than happens on the Earth. Most likely, I mean, well, not most likely, uh, it's equally plausible that, uh, what, that you just have some area that gets, you have a basin and you flood it with a liquid and whatever was down there is down there. There could be precipitants that, you know, go down and, and cover it a little bit, but then you'd have to have a reason for having the precipitants in the liquid to begin with. If they're very, very pure methane or ethane, you wouldn't expect there to be a lot. Um, if, if the uh, lakes are old, I mean billions of years old, then there would be enough time for stuff to rain down on the top and precipitate down to the bottom, tens or more uh, meters worth of stuff. Um, but if they are truly seasonal, which I think, again, there's a bias towards people believing, then there would not be enough time for stuff to precipitate out of the atmosphere and actually do much infilling. Are the sea floors substantially smoother than the regions around the seas? And if so, is the boundary the same boundary as the current shoreline? So that's a really good question. Um, the answer is we don't know the answer to that. And that's what uh, the, the roughness of the bottom of the seas gives rise to that difference. Remember I had those equations, well, I went very fast at the end through an equation that said the scattering efficiency between 10 and 100%. Um, the, I mean, those are pretty good boundaries on uh, a, a, a wide range of roughnesses. So basically the surface of the the, the subsurface, the bottom of the oceans, uh, can be as rough or smooth as we want it to be. And it would be all consistent with uh, these observations. Um, it may be that as we get better at analyzing these signals and we understand how to tease more things out about it, we can constrain that a little bit better. But there's a we know the overall attenuation quite well, but the question is how much of that attenuation is due to absorption in the liquid, how much of it is due to the roughness. And the range of possible attenuations in the liquid and the range in possible roughnesses on the ground uh, are such that almost any combination will work. Further questions should be uh, asked directly from the speaker. It's time to wrap up this part. And as every uh, speaker at the Institute, Howard is getting oh. a special SETI Talks mug. <laughs> well, thank you. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again.